tenacious D. Um, I'm glad it got there in time. Um, you know what's even cooler? Like, this is awesome. But even the envelope, I thought was really cool. Do you have, like, a bunch of these just lying around? Or is that from you had it in there? But I just love that it says 20th, 20th Century Fox Television. That's cool. So those are old school petty cash envelopes. And, of course, yeah, I, yeah. Love, I love paper. I'm a, I, I'm a saver of everything, right? So okay, I love paper. I like and one of the things that I've saved, which is, doesn't take up that much room, is uh, those envelopes. And those are petty oh, cash really? envelopes. I kind of sent it to you because you said you were an accountant. Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I just thought I would uh, uh, include that because um, yeah, I was, I was bringing it to the shipping store. So, anyway. That's awesome. No, I appreciate it. So, Don, this would be a lot of fun. I love... Uh, talking with people to figure out like why they got into this crazy game of Hollywood because it's a very unique career. You know, it's different type of job. It's not a nine to five job. So uh, where did it all begin? Where did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in Northern California. Um, I, my parents both moved to California from Iowa uh, oh, and okay. you know, they're sort of salt of the earth, the hardworking uh, Midwesterners and um my mother was a painter and an artist, but a homemaker. And my father was a carpenter and um, <laughs> had a construction company called Deers Construction, which was my father and his brother, uh, my uncle Vince, and ultimately uh, my older brother, Steve, my brother, Phil, and myself um, became okay. Deers Construction. Um, <laughs> my older brother went to college and studied something else. Uh, uh, my other brother, Phil, studied and went and got a film degree. Uh, at San Francisco oh, wow. State, and and because of um, in our childhood, like my father, who who wasn't an artist necessarily, but liked having a camera, uh, had Super 8 and 8 millimeter cameras around, and um, my brother Phil's kind of ingenious kind of uh, person to figure stuff out, um, technical, uh, and, and sort of, uh, anyway, so he was able to figure out like, oh, you know, how to load the camera and then eventually how to do pixelation. And then oh, he wow. ended up building a map box in front of our cheesy little Super 8 uh, camera and figured out old school uh, eight millimeter, you could back wind it because you could, there was a spool. Uh, Super 8 was in a cartridge and you couldn't mess with it as much or it wasn't as easy to figure out. So we ended up doing yeah. all these like goofy little movies based on, whatever we'd seen uh, including things like we went to disneyland as kids and saw um you know like this thing called pepper's ghost i don't know if you know the term for that but it's like a, a no trick what's that do you know what that is no no pepper's ghost is basically just a reflection and so when you're going through the ride and those guys are sitting with you it's done with mirrors, literally, or a piece of reflected glass. And those guys are up there, and the glass is tilted at 45. And wow. you're looking at the glass from your cart, and it's reflecting that. I don't know how he figured that out. But um, anyway, that leads me to the next thing, which is we ended up putting on, we got so inspired by the Haunted Mansion that we ended up putting on spook houses for the American Cancer <laughs> Society oh, um, wow. for years. Um and again, my mother was a saint because she was so tolerant of us being creative and, you know, making movies and then eventually making spook houses and then again, making movies and kind of always putting on a show. Yeah. So did she help um, you guys paint? Yeah, was, did she, what? did your mom get, did your mom get involved? Like with the painting of the, the spook houses or anything? Uh, she always was advising. Um, she wanted to. And, yeah, she probably did. I remember at times in my childhood, you know, you'd come home from school and the teachers would give you some creative project. And um, she would sort of like, oh, let me show you and, and take it out of your hands and halfway kind of do half of it for you. And then say, oh, do you yeah. understand now? And you're like, yeah, I have to finish it, Mom. <laughs> uh, no, she loved all the kind of, you know, I went to kind of you know, Northern California in the 70s was a little touchy feely. And um, so, uh, you know, every school I went to was brand new because um, we were in suburbia. Uh, and um, so I had the benefit of like, you know, if you don't want, you can make a movie for your English project uh, kind of thing. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I took full advantage of that. And, you know, I had one class which was, you know, analyzing Marshall McLuhan, you know, and, and you know, this is in grade uh, in junior high and high school. So um, I think uh, all that very much had a lot to do. Oh, my God, I just touched something and the whole thing disappeared. Oh, you're good. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't even know what to do. Oh, Maybe you just close the browser. Really? Okay. Yeah. No, do you want to leave? Change Am it. I back? Changes you made. Uh, cancel. Oh, there you are. Yeah. All right. Like, do you want to join Google? Do you want to join Chrome? Yeah. I don't know. Yes. And then, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, I think um, that environment of, of, of sort of um, a creative universe, uh, very much supported by the schools that I, we went to, and then my brother's genius. And um, and what was going on in the world, in a way, you know, like uh, the films of the '70s started changing too, and yeah. and you know, based on even the films of the '60s, when finally, like from the French New Wave, you know, uh, cinematographers and, and directors were taking the camera off the tripod and traveling it with a lighter, <laughs> and I think that kind of ease that was that maybe reflected in cinema at the time made it just feel like, you know, like we're, we're, we were fearless, you know, if we can make, you know, animated clay movies, like uh, we made one that was called Disc. Uh, it was all done with clay characters called stairs to scares or ghosts for hosts. And, wow. Uh, so that's based awesome. It would be Bullwinkle sort of uh, titles. Cause they always had those kind of titles on Bullwinkle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we just, you know, we screwed around with the camera a lot. And um, eventually, not unlike you and your partner ma making fun of things, we had um, uh, that was my husband calling to try to help me with the Google Chrome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I have what I call in my life hand holders, whereas like, if, if <laughs> I put something out, usually it's things like loading the camera and uh, taking exposures <laughs> and things like that. Um, yeah, and you know, my father, because my father was a, a carpenter, he allowed both my brother and I access to his workbench. So we both had sort of that background of, of, of you know, being able to make things with tools and being taught how, and then the ability of maybe painting things because of my mother's paint set. So, um, you know, that all kind of, kind of came full circle in my career. Yeah. And what was the first, so what was the next step? Did you got, obviously you were doing your own stuff. Did you start working with other directors or doing anything for plays? I, you know what? I, I knew I wanted to go to school. I didn't, in junior high, I'd written a letter to Francis Ford Coppola and, and asked yeah. him, what, what am I supposed to do to become a director? Like I thought I'd be a director. Everybody who goes to film school thinks they're going to be a director. And I'm like, uh, and he sent back and he answered and he's like, you know, I went to UCLA film school and I studied this. And I think he might have said he had taken drama. And so as I graduated from high school, I went to junior college in Northern California and um, took theater and I took um, directing and directing on camera. And I became a stage manager and eventually I directed theater up north and um and all of that played into come to find out uh, at the UCLA application for the film school. They don't just let anybody in. They kind of wanted a sort of humanities kind of breadth of information. And so they wanted to see art and sculpture and, you know, scripts and 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 then to find out, you know, they wanted to know if you had directed and do, are you OK of being around actors and whatever. And I had and I knew that that would help out. And, you know, thankfully, because I only applied to UCLA film school it was the only college I <laughs> dumb luck i got accepted you know i was very lucky and so you know it becomes a whole new world when you suddenly are in the the a bigger pond with very talented other people who also made super eight movies ever since yeah. they were kids right? like every nerd that showed up at ucla we had some kind of background like that uh and you know fun fact at the same time i was at ucla tim robbins and lee uh Ehrenberg were there too and I saw that you really? Lee for uh, the actor from Yeah, um, that's really it's funny. funny. How some of these things go full circle. Uh, I also was at um, the junior college where I was in theater. Uh, I was in theater with Kyle Gass, who is uh, one of the two of Tenacious oh, D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So some of these oh, things again, whatever reason, whether you're looking for links or not, became sort of full circle. Oh no, they come up like crazy, like. It's so funny in the behind the scenes 
uh, jobs like yourselves, uh, like that's where there seems like more of a community. When I've talked to people, it's like I'll mention somebody that has a ton of credits, but not a lot of people know my name. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I know him. I worked with him or he gave me a job one time. So there's like uh, definitely a community special effects. There's like this little there was like all those little crews and they all like know each other. It's like pretty fascinating. But yeah, and we don't look for the yeah. connections, but they're just there. They are there. And, and so, you know, like I teach and I told you that in the email too, is, yeah. you know, and I tell students like, you know, hang out with the, you know, the people you're making movies with in school very likely might get you your first job. And that's is what <laughs> happened. Um, this friend of mine, Aaron Warner, who went on to produce big movies um, was uh, six months ahead of me and started working on bad horror films and got me my first job on that, you know, and I'm cleaning toilets. Uh, I'm both driving this, the lead actress, Lisa Pelican, to her house back and forth as a PA, and then I'm, like, plunging toilets in this decrepit mansion called the Waddles Mansion. <laughs> because, you know, you like, wash your hands before you get in the car with her. But, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you kind of, I cut my teeth doing bad horror films at first, uh, and including... Um, those were all part-time jobs, although I worked on uh, Ghoulies and Critters. But oh, cool. A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, I was in the office, and, you know, I'm an artsy guy, and I'm running scripts and getting coffee and taking film to the lab or whatever, you know, PA does. And I left some of my artwork on the copy machine, and somebody found it, and they were like, you should be in the art department. And so they literally took me away from this woman, Lisa Cook, who was my the coordinator on the film, she's like, Lisa, Don's in our department now. <laughs> and really, uh, and, and, you know, I didn't even know what was going on, but uh, this decorator on the film, the production designer was a guy, Greg, uh, Greg Fonseca, uh, carried me under his wing for many movies. And the decorator wow. on that movie was like, Hey, Don, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I don't know what, whatever you tell me. And she's like, uh, there's a painting and Freddie's going to catch on fire in front of this painting. And we don't have doubles on it can you reproduce that painting before five o'clock? Oh, oh yeah, sure. There's Whoa. paints under the staircase. And I like, you know, Oh, really free paint. Like, you know, everything about movies is so, you know, and that was a cheap movie, but you know, there, there's the stuff's there to be creative. The stuff's there to, if you want to do it. And certainly if you want to work hard, um, Anyway, that was how it all began. That's a non-union wow, movie. That is insane. So you left yeah. it. Uh, so obviously you were working with, the, what was that first horror film that your, uh, your friend from class got you on? That was like the critters and the ghoulies. That was, that was ghoulies. They'll okay. get you in the end. Do you remember that one? <laughs> yes. the guys coming out of the toilet. <sighs> okay. No, so, so, so that's crazy. So you leave your art by mistake and, the rest is history, pretty much. The rest wow. is history, and it is. It's funny how they're like little sort of jumping off, or little pro like a like a rocket has a little propeller and it sends you off to the next thing, you know. And that was that was the first one. And again, I had no idea what a dope. I had done sets for for theater, and I didn't know this was a job yeah. in the movie business. <laughs> um, and you know, like I say, fell into it. And so, um, the so I did like, I don't know good amount of movies, art directing and on-set dressing for Greg and Anne. And, you know, on-set dressing is a really good place to start because the set is already made and dressed and and all you have to do is keep continuity. And so... Oh, you so know, that's so, a job. That's all. So that's what an on-set dresser is? Because, oh man, that's, that's tough. So yeah, you are... So you are one of one or the, maybe the only person but in those years the prop people would help you there was this transition when i finally got in the business it was almost like they invented this position because they realized we needed it and yeah. um i'm not even sure the union still even recognizes it um it's always a credit in films but you know it's under set dresser as opposed to on set dresser and wow. um you what was great about it for me is that um I finally got to be in Hollywood by watching directors set up each shot and then execute it. The DP asking me to, you know, close the window blinds or fix the sheets or, or wasn't, wasn't the telephone on the receiver over there in the previous shot, shot. like your continuity uh, interview very much. I could relate to her talking yeah, because yeah, yeah. you have to keep your eyes of continuity on the actors. You're trying not to keep your eyes on like every dumb little piece of furniture in the room. Right. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, when camera moves from that corner to this corner, you put that corner back together and, and, and make this corner look good. And uh, I did that. And I remember on one movie I did that was called Static. And it was this weird art film that was about this guy who invented a TV you could see heaven. Um, and, you know, it was a Amanda Plummer, Plummer and Keith Gordon. And oh, okay. um, I am on set dressing. And I would run in and and they said, like he Keith gets out of bed or something, and I would run over in the scene and I would s style the sheets of his bed so it looked like the Caravaggio painting or some classic because <laughs> I was an art nerd, you know. Like I'm, it's kind yeah. of beautiful what we shot, and the director and the, the first AD would love Don get out, you know, like <laughs> it doesn't have to look like a Caravaggio painting. It's not about the sheets. <laughs> So you kind of again learn for in a big way you learn uh, all the kinds of things that are important to the DP to the lighting to editing continuity and again since I'd gone to film school I understood the importance of continuity and being able to cut back and forth between characters and um, so it was in my second film school was doing non-union uh, horror films and low budget films. Wow, that is awesome. So what so what is the order on set? So it's on set dresser and then there's set dresser and then is art director. Yeah, it is starts it in that with, sense. It starts with the production designer who gets a head credit on the film. So you may not see them in the role at the end. Production designers um sometimes will design both wardrobe and uh the all the sets. It's more in contemporary worlds, not so much, but like Catherine Martin, Baz Luhrmann's wife is uh, that kind of production designer. She designs okay. costumes and stuff. Um, but mostly production designer means that they're designing the entire production. And that includes choosing the locations, um, being involved in the props, if not you know, overseeing them, but being approving of them. And under the production designer within their department is a art director, assistant art director. And what I always get called, which is wrong, is a set designer. Um, <laughs> so set designer is like an architect. They draw all, everything. Um, the art directors oh, okay. oversee the set designers and all the locations, all the construction, all the paint. Um, and the construction coordinator is right in there, too, if it's a big enough film, which most shows build sets. And so this construction coordinator is also in that in that uh, club with the art department. In, and they run painters and sign makers. And, um, and then they jive with special effects, which is another department. And then my department, which I ended up uh, 10 years into my career, decided um, kind of after Biodome to no longer art direct again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I started set decorating and um, so set decorators are their own department and run um, that department and basically we fill out the character um, if if every single room on earth was um, uh, built and was a set the walls the architecture the windows the doors the floor would be the art department and every single item that fills a room would be a oh, set boy. decorator so it's a huge job, and what it's also about is the details, and 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 fleshing out character with objects, so that yeah. the so that that's communicated. And and sometimes there's no character. Sometimes you're doing offices. Sometimes you're doing a morgue. You know, you're doing strange sets. Um, I remember one day Greg Fonseca told me on House Two. He says he says Don, uh, meet me at this place tomorrow. We're doing a pterodactyl nest. And we go, that doesn't happen often. <laughs> Um, well, you know, that's, you know, so I'm glad I didn't go into interior design because I'd be, do, be doing bathrooms and, and kitchens and, you know, bedrooms. <laughs> and, um, thankfully, you know, in this world, which again, I love film. I, I, I didn't have a plan B, so I'm glad it worked out. Um, yeah. and, and same with set deck in, in that, um, what happened is I think I, again, on Biodome kind of just was like, okay, this isn't a good fit. And, um, <laughs> And saw, I was on Red Rock West and the set decorator was in one of the sets and she was going into voices. It was like she was talking as the characters and she was dressing the set and putting things in different places and, you know, figuring it out. And she was doing it kind of in character. And I was like, the light bulb went off and I'm like, that's what, <laughs> that's how I see the, I always do voices and I'm always doing yeah. that kind of thing. Like, and I, I've always like, you know, like in the 
70s, I was going to thrift stores and always curious. I would buy stuff from the 50s and I was curious like the people who own things and I would create backstories. So it was a ideal fit. Yeah, know? perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So what was it about Biodome? Was it uh, just like too much? Well, yeah. I mean, so I had art directed plenty of movies before that that had budgets. Oh, yeah. And even movies that didn't have such big budgets, but didn't have such a, a, a enormous appetite. Again, um, Biodome is the lead character. It is the title of the film. And yeah, yeah. as production designer Michael Johnson told me the other day, he said, you know, they were thinking they were making something like Dumb and Dumber or some kind of like contained show when in the script it talks about each of the pods that they're in and it's a forest or it's the tropical or it's the <laughs> yeah, desert. Yeah. I mean, how do you, you know, and they wanted us to do it in, in um, party tents, like rent those vinyl white party tents. Like, <laughs> but you, then they were going to cut to like an exterior of um, the, at the beginning of the film, there's the water reclamation place where they cut yeah. the river and, and all that. So if that's the exterior of it and they get locked in and now we're in a party tent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, recently some uh, friend of mine told me I was talking about, um, uh, how, um, you know, just how films and television kind of get out of hand with the, the money and so on. And he said, oh, yeah, now they're having outside firms uh, generate the budgets of how you're supposed, how much you're supposed to spend. And I'm like, this is like, you know, getting further and further away from the person you should be asking how much the price of beans are. Like, I know yeah, how much yeah. you know, a mattress in a box springs you know, rents for or whatever. We've been doing it for a good amount of time. So so I think they were, um, I would say they were definitely over the over their head in what they had written. And Michael Johnston and I and uh, Carl Saber, Sable, um, the other art director, and Carl was in charge of um, the more uh, technical parts of art directing. So the drafting and hiring a firm to take care of structural engineering because it needed to be uh, stand up and not blow over in the wind yeah so uh and i was more in charge of you know softer things and, at that time but i think the what i came out of that movie with is i was one one day i was on set and i was exhausted because i was working with the greens crew and um and you know the greens crew were there making it look like each of these pods so you know the forest would look like a forest the farm set would look like a farm the, the <laughs> desert looks like a desert and and uh, we shot on a union lot so we're a non-union film shooting on a union lot and we have basically pas helping uh be the greensman and digging holes for hundreds of plants and i'm <laughs> up there with them because you're, you know the, the, when you rent a location on the back lot you're the one who makes it look like what you want to look like right and it's just you know what it is and so we wanted it to be these biodome look and I'm out there with, because, you know, we're trying to meet a deadline. I'm out there helping the greens crew dig, 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 day in, day out. I'm sunburned. I got blisters. My feet have <laughs> yeah. blisters. And I'm in the, the lunch line one day during shooting. And um, Steve Sabler, the producer, comes up to me and he says, Michael told me you're supposed to be watching the budget. And I'm like, I'm watching my blisters. Like, I am, <laughs> oh, I am like literally manual labor on this show. We're so under crewed. Um, and at, that was kind of the point where I was like, I don't want to be blamed for this. I'm not even great at this, you know, like I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, that wasn't my strength. So I kind of was like, okay, this is the last time I'm doing this. Yeah. That looked like it costs a lot of money. And obviously when there's a time frame, you have to spend more money to get it done sooner. And, uh, wow. What, what happened to it after the movie? Did you ever, was it like torn down right it away it or disassembled, disassembled? The whole thing was disassembled. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Did we recycle the, the all that metal work? Yeah. I mean, it was, if you see, cause I, that's why I sent you the photos. Yo, those pictures are awesome. Those are so cool. And that just kind of give you a reference of one, what we do behind the scenes, but also yeah. the massive task of creating, um, uh, the superstructure over upper and lower falls, which is like a whole hillside on the universal back lot. Yeah. Um, that's insane. And then we shot in the desert and we built this desert pod as a separate pod um, out in the desert, which is not small as you can see from the photos as well. 
Yeah. And, um, oh, it was hot out there. Oh my God. <laughs> Lancaster in spring and summer is awful. And, um, <laughs> But, you know, it's very convincing, you know, like our part of the show is, uh, you know, to do the physical sets. And then you see the post-production, they, you know, did add-ons to make it look like that that pot in the desert, you could see the rest of it. And then they use the model, too, which I sent you photos of as well, yeah. which are, you know, also convincing. Like, you, bu you buy it. Yeah. No, that's so cool. And so now, so you graduate, when did you graduate? I guess like 82, 83? I graduated 83, stuck around. Uh, I, I graduated 83. Um, I got into UCLA in 80, and you're supposed to be out in two years. But, you know, when you have your own editing room, it's hard to pry you out of there. So I stuck yeah, around yeah. in 83. And um, then I started working on little movie, little parts of movies as a PA. And then by 84, I did Nightmare on Elm Street. And um, that was the year of the Olympics, too. So, yeah. Um, we we were at this uh, studio on um, uh, Coenga called um, Renmar Studios, and it was part of the old Desi Lu, um, old studios. And we had a time frame because the what was called the Olympic Arts Festival was coming, and they needed these stages for sort of Cirque du Soleil performances of things they were doing that was part of the Olympics cultural uh, program they were doing. So um, we all were afraid of the Olympics that year. And and it was like what we called Carmageddon here where everybody was afraid when the 405 closed down, everybody just stayed at <laughs> home. Uh, during yeah. the Olympics, a lot of us left town. And um, Catherine Hardwick, the director of 13 and um, some of the, um, uh, what are the vampire movies called again? Um, oh, the Twilight movies? Twilight, she directed the Twilight movies. Oh, she wow. was at the film school with Catherine and she invited a bunch <laughs> of us to escape the Olympics and we went to Mexico and we made this movie called The, <laughs> the Night with the Iguana Women, uh, which <laughs> did not come out like again, you know, bad exposure on, you know, people like me <laughs> who are not technical. So um, I thought we had a great time and, you know, we es we escaped the Olympics. Wow. Yeah, wow. so that's no, when I started. It was a cool. good time to get into Hollywood. Oh yeah, no. I was asking because tape heads in '88. Were you? Was it like, oh, hey, Lee or Tim, or did you guys keep in contact between then? Catherine did. Catherine, oh, okay. um, much better at that than me. And so uh, again, I went to film school with Catherine. In fact, I'm in one of her student films. She um, had been an architect before she went to film school. Graduates about the same time I do. Starts doing shows and um, contacts me and because I had started to get a few credits in the art department and art directing set deck. I don't think I'd set deck that I And she recruited me and, you know, I don't know why, like Lee Ehrenberg got in, I think because of Tim and- Yeah, Tim he said, was that's what he said, yeah. Yeah, the actor's gang. And so there were a couple of those groups that when, you, again, I talk about these things come full circle. I was in one of those too. The people I went to film school with, we all graduated and we were like, oh, my God, you know, it's sort of like it's pitch and it's you're you're you got so much going on when you're in film school. And all of a sudden it ends and you're like waiting for the phone to ring or you're on a show and it's, you know, dull because you're a PA on walkie talkie or whatever. <laughs> and we started this improv group called Improvateria Presents. Oh, and nice. I love improv. We had we had a half hour show that was on public access, so <laughs> it was super low budget and really cheesy. And I have to tell you, it was vaudeville because the acts that came before us and after us were eye rolling bizarre. Like there was a psychic, <laughs> there was a, a, a really bad Hollywood celebrity guy named Skippy Lowe who had a show, and and we ended up doing these shows and started developing characters. And again, it's live TV, so we would yeah. yeah off camera and then give the other person your lavalier mic because it was so low budget not everybody could have a mic um so that kind of stuff was worked into blocking and um and that's and awesome that what'd you guys be, do short form or long form we did short, short form live uh, we did um several shows we did this one called um irma cramps coffee clatch where we were all in drag so i was in television very early doing drag and uh, <laughs> And then we did a show called The God Club, which was a parody of the religious television shows where there, uh, th yes. there was a husband and wife. That's a great and so idea. every week we would play different characters who were guests on The God Club. 
Um, oh man, man, why don't they do that now? That'd be a great Im- that's a great idea, that improv show to do yeah. each week a different thing, and then for that 30 minutes you're improvising a, a show, like a basic genre. That's awesome. It was great. And then we it, all of us were talented film people. And so at, by the end, we did it for three years. It was pretty exhausting because every, you know, every month we would show up, uh, we'd rehearse for ahead of time. And then they gave us a show. They gave us a slot which was coveted and we got an hour show so um we got two hours of studio time so we got a half hour to set up an uh, hour of shooting time and a half hour to strike and we decided to do a show that we ended up um called that we called it the friday night theme show because we couldn't think of what else to call it and that yeah, yeah. just have themes every week and each yeah. one of us produced a show and so i did a show that was all about fish because i was into fish at the time and I had fish on my resume and I would put a fish on every set. Like I was my thing for a minute. And, and so we would just shots every week. We would just shoot sequences for our show. Like somebody else did one that was, you know, another subject like caveman. And so it, within the shooting of the one hour show, we'd be doing fish characters and then we'd be off stage changing into our caveman characters and then come back on. And then we'd cut it in the, the we had a friend who had an editing room. So then we, that show was actually not live when we cut it and, at theme music and we did a whole opening sequence with us like you know every actor on every tv show where you get your little cami cameo in yeah, the yeah. Front of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. um we always were doing absurdist stuff and um and and i don't know that was a great time yeah wow. but, uh, do you have any records of that do you have any tapes or is it anywhere <sighs> yeah i think um the producer who got us the slot, this guy, Art Mandrala, who became an editor, um, has, I think, the masters, most of the masters. Oh, that's and, rad. And my good friend, Frank Raywald, and I kept the three-quarter inch tape from the 80s, so I don't know how long it's going to last. I think it degenerates <laughs> at yeah, some yeah. point. But I just, a fun fact, those slides I sent you, I mean, those photos you, I sent you were slides I took in 95 because that's what I was shooting. And I found oh, a guy really? in the alley here to transfer him and he's like oh he's kind of a russian guy he's like I, I can transfer anything you have and i'm like oh i have vhs i have three quarters anything you have i can transfer so uh now that i discovered this guy i might start to pull yeah. his tapes out that is so cool that i was shocked when i talked to and i know it was that boom in the mid 80s when like snl was doing that weird transition like when lauren was gone and they had like the the bad years and they just had every, every young actor in Hollywood. Like, I didn't realize until like two weeks ago that Anthony Michael Hall was only like 17 or 18 on SNL, which is pretty yeah. insane for a young kid to be exposed to everything that went on like at night or the after party at like that young of an age. But when he told me that uh, Lee, when Lee told me him and Tim got flown out to audition, I was like floored. And then, but then I was like, you know, cause they didn't have any, they didn't do any stand up. They had some characters from like the shows that they did, but he was saying it was just, they were trying to take every hot young uh, up and coming talent and try to get them early. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I've flown out to New York to do the audition in front of everyone. But uh, man, that's so cool that you did improv that, that ah, that's great. It helps, you know, I think what it does is it helps you know that first of all, I don't want to be an actor. I'd realized that too, you know, and, um, <laughs> So you have empathy for the actors now too, but you also understand that if something goes wrong on the cameras rolling and if you're in character, you know, you can do anything, you know, or, or you, you at least have a vocabulary of a few things you can pull from. And, and um, yeah, it, 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 it did help round me out and it was more fun than anything. I wasn't doing it to become oh, yeah. famous or anything. We were having fun making our shows. Yeah, I was in Portland, and Portland had a big improv scene, and I've always loved improv, like Who's Line or UCB, and I took classes, and it was like the coolest two classes I've ever took in my life. It was just so much fun. Every week, it was just, uh, it was, it's a team sport, which is like something you don't think of when you come think of like acting, but you trust the other person that you're going to do something, and I hope you're going to follow me, because if not, it's going to get a little awkward. And that's it. I think, you know, there's the, they say um, in improv, the answer is always yes and. And so yep. when you say supporting the other actor, it's never know that you're wrong and, and then you derail the, the conversation. I think even 
for what we do uh, now and just taking it again sort of to where I'm at now is it, you know the script says one thing and then the director says another thing and then the producer says another thing and then and, and um, the production designer says another thing and all that for me again I'm under all those people is yes and here's how I'm going to do it yeah right because you know you don't want to say oh I can't do that you know that sounds hard <laughs> no, we'll yeah, find somebody that will say yes yeah yes um, <laughs> yeah so uh, you know and I think that if you're not a hardworking and positive yes kind of person in showbiz, I think you don't make it as far. You know, you don't. Yeah. You don't. The phone doesn't ring as often. No, I agree. Because people want to hire people they like. You know, you can have three people interview for the same job. One person can be super qualified. One not so qualified. But if you like the not so qualified guys, you're gonna to want to hang out with them after work, you know. If you if the person has the best qualifications, and that's just how it is. It's like, you know, life is that popularity contest. They say that it isn't in high school. Yeah. You know, we... <laughs> well, and also, you know, there's there's solitary positions, editing and writing, and if you aren't like yeah. you know sort sort of outgoing, but you know you you understand this part. Um, I have great respect for the screenwriters because again, that's where it all comes from. It comes off the page. Yeah. You know? And I don't have that ability. I'm not a writer. I, I I grew up dyslexic and didn't even know it until I was in film school. And I was I was wow. making this movie. Uh, we were doing live TV uh, at the time. It was again early '80s, and we were doing rock videos. And um, I worked with this. Um, my professor was Shirley Clark. She was an experimental filmmaker from New York. And I made this live dance performance where um, I had four cameras going and I told one camera to be wide and on the other three cameras just to focus on like the arms and the legs. And I made this thing live called Dancing Video Puzzle where I basically, I, brought, I, I, I hired a dance troupe to do this dance that they did, but then I photographed it the way I wanted to photograph <laughs> it and disassembled it. And then in the editing room and live by switching from camera to camera. And then I also split the screen live. Um, <laughs> put it back together and took it apart. And anyway, That's that awesome. was, but I didn't know, you know, at the time the professor's like, Don, how did you do that? She goes, how could you even see like that? She said, and then she asked me the questions of typically like, do you have trouble reading? I'm like, oh yeah, numbers and letters jump all around, you know, P and D and Q are all the same letter to me, you know, they just happen to yeah. be in different positions. And, um, and she's like, oh yeah, well, I, you know, and then she talked about some other famous people being dyslexic and, I was like, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I'm basically out of school now. So I guess I'm safe, you know, because I yeah. did have trouble reading and all those things. Thank God I could make movies for book reports. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, it's so it, just some people, I guess you don't know it because you don't know uh, if other people are dealing with the same thing and you don't want to ask. So yeah. that's, and, you know, thank God they tested us for vision because, um, I mean, I didn't actually wear glasses until I um, started to drive. And I always thought that, the, that when people looked up in the sky and saw stars, I always thought that was like a National Geographic photograph. Like you couldn't do that. And, you know, come to find out my first pair of glasses, I was like, oh, my God, you can see the stars. What? Oh, my God. Uh, but, yeah. So, you know, it. Um, yeah, there was a sort of a aha moment there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what what is the process for for you like when you get on a job, let's say like when you're a set director, like what is the first thing you do? Is it uh, meet with the producers, reviewing the script, and starting jotting down like how would you would take it? Like what's usually? I know it's different with every director and producer, no, but it's it's kind of the same. So so yeah. as a set decorator, and I'll repeat it three times: set decorator, set decorator, <laughs> because everybody gets it wrong. We are the set decorator, <laughs> not the set director, because we decorate. <laughs> um, and it's a joke. I have to tell you, I belong to the Set Decorator Society of America, and I, I, I it, people get it wrong all the time. We're always correcting people in the press, like Variety, who should, by the way, know. Um, but, uh, so the first thing you do is someone calls you, usually it's the designer. It's usually, that's how you get the job. And so the designer calls you and says, okay, we're going to do this show. Let's say, um, kidding the show I did with Jim Carrey and Michelle Gondry. Yeah. Um, and that it's, um, you know, we're going to do, uh, 15 episodes of this TV show. It's, you know, uh, somewhat magical realism and based, uh, in Ohio, where Jim Carrey plays uh, a Mr. Rogers neighborhood kind of character. 
and and you come to find out by reading the script okay there are the sets that are on camera sets which is the children's show and then mm -hmm. there is his crumbling life and they don't you know and so then you meet with the designer and the director and they talk about how they want the feeling to be uh, very often. They don't talk always about look or specific colors or things like that. We start talking about what's the feeling and how do we want to communicate? And, and, and then as the production designer and I know, or probably the cinematographer tricks on how to communicate that. Right. And so then, um, uh, the designer will, I usually starts a few weeks before me will have drawings and and what I call tear sheets, which is we used to tear images out of magazines. Now you pull things from <laughs> interest or, or uh, yeah, other yeah. source. <laughs> um, and so Max would start out with these these board, we call them boards, uh, their look boards. And so that's also how you sell the studio on the show. So I might contribute imagery and, and they contribute imagery. We do a, a little what we call a dog and pony show for the studio. Like this is what the, the sets uh, on camera are going to look like. Oh, and this okay. is what the sets in the rest of Ohio are going to look like. And um, and then they, you know, say, OK, and then they say go. And you then you spend, you know, some time putting together a budget so that they don't you don't have a bio bill yet. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then I do what's called breakdowns, and in my budget, I basically break everything down. I just list everything. So, you know, in in Jeff's sad apartment or in in the television studio, I'll list everything. Uh, I'll list the television cameras, the backings, the the because I'm in show business, I know what a film studio looks like. We were building, a, you know, this is like bringing sand to the beach. You know, we're building a yeah, soundstage. Yeah. <laughs> a soundstage. Um, but that's showbiz all over. And so I'm making that breakdown. And then if I don't know the prices on things, I guess. And so you do initial budgets and all that. And then while you're doing that, your team usually have um, some buyers uh, and the buyers are assistant decorators, basically. And and you give them um, the list of the things that we're looking for most uh, urgently, okay. the things that are hard to find, um, maybe things that we have to buy and ultimately we'll have to paint or or whatever so they start out and they've got a, several weeks of, of trying to find or will find these things and you put them on hold in hollywood there are prop houses and in each prop house you, there's a system on how you reserve a piece of furniture and we call it tagging furniture and so you dash in person around los angeles the, on the valley <laughs> side on the hollywood side of the hill tagging furniture and photographing you know lots and lots of furniture and coming back with ideas. And you know what happens during that process is you start to see the movie build itself. And and you're part of the movie, right? So, you know, I start focusing on light fixtures or I start focusing on colors or I start focusing on weird textures that I want to combine. And and um, or I'll do an entire trip downtown just swatching fabric um, because I'm going to upholster things and so on. Um and and so then you start, you know, so then you've got your 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 folders together and you're you you would show and tell again with the directors and the producers. And, and again, after you've kind of turned in a budget, it's just given that you're going to stay on budget unless you let them do otherwise. So that conversation is yeah. over with. And now it's about the specifics. And, and now the director says, I want to do this shot. And I want to do this shot. And how are we going to figure that out? And by the way, we want to do this in episode six. And you don't have the script for that yet, but we're going to give you this heads up on that. So you get the chance to, oh, well, I should work that into the set in episode two, right? And uh, in film, you get the script ahead of time, which is genius, right? But in television, you know, they sort of parse it out in episode one and, you know, there's secrets. And the writer's room is <laughs> you know, a whole bunch of chaos that I, I'm glad I'm not involved with because they really do have to it out. Um, so uh, then you start, the, so meanwhile, the production designer and the art directors are having the sets built. The construction coordinator has bid this job as well, hired a crew, painters, carpenters. They start building these sets. And um, and then usually the, 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 it goes, the construction finishes, painters come in as painters are finishing, set decorators coming in with their crew. And concurrently with the set decorators coming in is the electricians. And the electricians are firing up all the practicals, which is what we call light fixtures. Because most most film now is digital. And um, in a lot of shows, set decorators are literally lighting the set. Um, that 
all the source of light is stuff I'm supplying. And that may not be everything. Like there's a window in front of me right here. That window is supplying a good amount of light, but I have a table yeah. right here. I might have a little accent light back there. Um, what happens is the DP and the decorator try to be hand in glove about that. Like, um, I'm kidding. There was one thing where Sean, the DP, wanted to have lights look at the camera. He wanted to have like back here, he just wanted to have a bulb. And he often did it. So it got this glare and it was, it was like an emotional sort of irritating, disturbing kind of thing that, I, again, is part of the vocabulary of film where you find something that's going to help us get that mood and so on. So, um, and then you're, then, you know, once you've, you're rolling, you know, you're just rolling, you just can't stay ahead of the schedule, the steamroller, which is production. So they just finished Jeff's apartment and they're on their way to the studio and, you know, you're trying to finish that up and, and, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. and still prep next week's episode. And, and then have you know talking about the what's in production meetings what's coming in episode six, um, so as a department head you're kind of um, both an artist and a manager, uh, very much so, and uh, uh, and you know very much part of the creative process, which is why I stuck with it because you know coming out of film school thinking I'm going to be a director, I realized I I think I have a lot to take care of. I watch these television directors like how many people come up to them with a question about next week's episode and they're trying to talk to an actress and you know talk to the DP and it's it would make me cross-eyed. <laughs> Has there ever been uh like a certain item that was called for? that was like difficult to get or like a last minute change that you had to like frantically change anything. Um, that happens every week. Yeah. That it does. does. Yeah. And it <laughs> does. And I have to say, Doug, thank God I've been working in Hollywood because we do have the support of this, the prop houses and all of our vendors. Like, you know, again, in kidding, I had to do um, a cat scan um, in one of the, in the, one of the episodes, um, the, they, they go through the CAT scan and um, we had to find a working CAT scan. Well, because we have specialty prop houses, I, I was, I, I knew that was in the script and I went <laughs> to them ahead of time, um, this place called Alpha Medical and reserved the CAT scan like two months in advance because um, <laughs> yeah, we wanted a certain look on a CAT scan because it had to have this round shape. There's other ones, but we were doing a matte shot of like basically a donut shot there was a match cut to something else. So early on for the DP and Michelle Gondry, the director, you have to have that thing there on the day of shooting. So I was like, okay, let's make sure we reserve the CAT scan. Um, but I think, you know, like, again, I have a story about when I was on the Santa Claus, um, Santa Claus 3, uh, they had shot the first two Santa Clauses in Canada. And when they came he here, we vowed to make this the best looking Santa Claus out of the three films. And we did Santa's kitchen and um, I made everything in there. There's a crazy amount of like, you know, um, what it was called, what I called like a Hoosier cabinet on steroids. And there was this goofy scene with this cappuccino machine that gets broken <laughs> and it's made out of all these weird clued shapes. And again, it's a children's film, so it has a different uh, vocabulary but I had forgot to get the dining room chairs and the, the, all the legendary figures, which is like the bunny rabbit or Easter bunny and the tooth fairy and yeah. mother nature all had to sit down. And, and within a few days I was like, Oh my God, how did I forget the chairs? And I <laughs> dashed away from the studio and went to a, one of my favorite sources and I bought two different sets of dining room chairs and brought them back and apologized to the production designer. And he took pictures of them. And I said, I have to get him upholstered. And he said, get him upholstered. When they come back, I'm going to have the painters paint them so they all kind of match. And he did a very cute, we had the inspiration from Mary Blair. Mary Blair was one of uh, Walt Disney's uh, uh, women animator artists. Like she kind of came up with the idea for It's a Small World. So the wow. look of small, you know, have you been to Disneyland and seen that? Yeah, yeah, Disney World, yeah. Yeah, so she was responsible. So that was part of one of the artists that we were emulating. And so he ended up painting the, these last minute chairs that I got um, to look a very kind of Mary Blair kind of uh, cute vocabulary. Oh, uh, sweet. Yeah, no, I was trying to think is there's got to be sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, we need this. And it's like impossible to get 
that or volume. Of, sometimes they ask for such volume of things. Oh yeah, and, and you're trying. You're you are trying to figure it out. Um, again, on Santa Claus, it was um, you know we have this concern in film uh, mostly about artwork, but sometimes it's about other objects where it has to be cleared. You can't just use this painting that's behind me. You have to get a clearance from the artist that says it's okay. Oh, otherwise, okay. Uh, that's another mountain of work. Uh, it is enormous amount of work. So um, there are prop houses in LA that just specialize in artwork that's cleared. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, on Santa, um, there there's a sequence where the conveyor belts in Santa's workshop. Again, I had to I had to supply conveyor belts, moving conveyor belts, moving the toys to each of these little stations where little elves are making excuse me, things out of wood and things out of metal. And these were stuffed animals, but these stuffed animals couldn't be copywritten stuffed animals. So I couldn't be using Winnie the Pooh or even a traditional teddy bear. I was finding Chinese ripoffs in downtown LA. (laughs) Enormous district in downtown LA called the Toy District. Um, It's right next to the Bong District. Downtown has everything, but... (laughs) Um, anyway, so I, I, I would leave downtown if, with my car jammed with as many toys as I could get because we were constantly altering toys uh, to accommodate whatever the sequence was. And, you know, so again, it was sometimes it's like cleared toys, hundreds and hundreds of them. And here's the color palette. So, you know, that's like painting you into a corner where you're like, it has to be all those things and it has to be here in two days. And, you know, lots of times in film, which is typical of, of production is, yeah, everybody's, oh, you can find it online. Yeah. And how many days is it going to take to get yeah. it? I it tomorrow. I know. Um, no, that's, I never so, thought of the cleared thing. Like, I always think of yeah. that in movies. Sometimes you see, like, uh, like a prominent company, not like a big one, but you'll see, like, a ketchup bottle and it's, like, Heinz. And I'm like, they have to, like, get the okay from Heinz, right? There are two things. So there, and especially it was happening in the eighties and nineties, this thing called um, product placement. No, so there, yeah, uh, 80s, product 90s, placement it was everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So, so those <laughs> people would all like uh, a product placement house would have a stable of, you know, Nabisco and general mills and, and, you know, a Sony or whatever kind of electronics. And they'd have a little from column A and column B so that you would call them and say, okay, I need to have a soda on camera. And 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 this is what they mostly say is, oh, just turn the label away from camera. And like, no, the director wants to see it. They think it's better if it's real. And so these product placement houses are there to support us. And and they, they jump through hoops to make this kind of stuff happen. Um, thankfully, uh, they exist also in hand and glove here in Los Angeles because um, – you know, you can send a truck like, OK, now I need um, not Apple computers like you might distinguish between two characters in your movie. Yeah. yeah these are Apple kind of people and these are Dell kind of people. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's weird shit that we go through to, to sort of flesh out a character. That's um, great. When so, you think about that, there's so many times you can see a scene like uh somebody goes into their bedroom. They go into it. Like a kid goes into their bedroom and you see, you basically like before they even speak, you can like know so much about them. So no, that's so cool. It's so much goes into it. And I love that you did that inner dialogue to yourself. You know, when you would pick up objects at like a thrift shop, a thrift shop when you're younger, that's great. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we joke in my department uh, is that, um, dialogue is off screen and camera is hovering <laughs> on set dressing <laughs> because that's almost never the case. You know, the, I always call it the big fat actor head because then you suddenly don't see any of the set. Um, yeah. but, you know, you see it in the wide shot, you see it in the walk and talk, you see plenty of the sets, but we jokingly talk about that because, um, I bet, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and sometimes, you know, there, uh, sometimes like, I went uh, again. I was I'm teaching, and um, we took the students to Warner Brothers, and um, ran into his decorator. We know Richard Walker, and he was he's doing Young Sheldon, and he took him through the set. Like, oh hey, we oh, it was completely wow. one of those moments that never happens in like real life. <laughs> and you know, all these people who are looking up to you, students, and we're like, oh, there's somebody I know. Let's go walk through the sets of Young Sheldon, which 
you know, the producers might, might watch this video and be like, I didn't think I didn't approve that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Anyway, I didn't. <laughs> and I pointed out to the students, I'm like, see how dense these sets are and how many times maybe something's repeated or or it sort, sort of feels like we see the same idea. We do that because we don't know for some characters what's going to be on on the shot. And you want to make sure you set up this character that might only have two walls behind them and you want to establish who they are or what we'd call um, uh, color coding characters where you have certain palette of colors that that helps the audience identify who the uh, the character is because maybe this whole sequence is just on this phone and this Dawn character is in this mushroom colored room and, and you <laughs> yeah. know the other characters in a, a light blue room. And, um, and in these sets uh, for young Sheldon, it was a perfect it was a perfect way of being able to illustrate that by because it really felt like oh there's an awful lot of art in this room for <laughs> this but you want to make sure that there's something behind the character that helps uh basically tell the story yeah no that's so true now, that's great that you mentioned young Sheldon. i want to because obviously when you're working on film you're there from the beginning i would say for the yes. most part i'm sure there's times that some other guy didn't work out and they brought somebody else in. I don't know if that yes. ever happened, yes. but I'm sure that happens. Uh, yes. but, but like doing like a TV spot, how is that different than when you're going in and having to keep a feel for the show? Is it just, do you talk to the guy that was there the week before? Do you watch old episodes? How does that work? Yes. Uh, so you're talking about like, if you're doing an episode uh, for on a show, Yeah, like if you do an episode like Jane, the Virgin, I know you worked on a few of those. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, community. Again, so, so yeah, so, yes, exactly. That's a perfect example. Thank you for even noticing that. I would have forgot. Uh, so Jane the Virgin was easily established before I got there, and so what Jane's look is, and what maybe what her colors were, um, and and Cynthia Charette. When I did the Jane the Virgin, they had hired Cynthia Charette, a designer I did a couple of shows with, and she oh, and okay. I slowly ticked the look a different direction, and and again. Because they hired her, we figured that you know you want the, the, a little of Cynthia and Dawn, and um, and so we did that. So you start off with uh, absolutely for continuity, and so the whole show can cut together, keeping it the same. But what we did is slowly uh, the Marabella, I think is the name of the hotel. We started to sort of update the Marabella a little bit, and um, so you know. It's not that you have to pee in every corner so you can say, oh, you know, I was here and this is, you know, now it's my set. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I've done plenty of shows. When I did X-Files, a lot of those sets were established before I got there. They were established in Canada. Um, and so um, you have to follow that. And so, yeah, you have continuity photographs. Um, when you shoot it, when you do a show, you shoot your own continuity set photos. The onset dresser shoots continuity photographs. The still photographer, if there's a publicist on set, they shoot photographs and sometimes they see the set. Um, so you have a good amount of evidence to put it back together. Um, when I did Community, um, that TV show, um, Denise Pizzini was the set decorator and then she was bumped up to become production designer. And she brought me on because we had worked together uh, as the set decorator. Many of the permanent sets were there, so I didn't have to do anything to them until something was written in. And so I was just maintaining the permanent sets with the same crew that had been there before me, her crew. And then I started to do my version of um, what, you know, the crazy episodes were calling for, including pillows yeah. and blankets. It's like a puzzle. It's such an interesting, you have to have a special eye for that like the, like getting a photo of a set and then putting it together standing back that's got to be i'm sure it gets frustrating but it's kind of fun well that part's almost like forensics too you know yeah a lot of our job is like a lot of things with psychology it's it's anthropology you know it's um all kinds of strange sort of i think of what i do is sort of assemblage like making collage or assemblage because you're taking different elements and putting them together and and those same elements or if you change out three of those elements suddenly it means a different thing yeah uh, and that's the beauty of you know because you might rent the same chair again you know three times in hollywood um but uh depending on what 
the other objects you're surrounding it with, it's communicating a whole nother thing. Yeah. That's the strength no, of it too. No, it's fascinating. Just the, yeah, like you said, the psychology that goes into even just putting all that together. Yeah. And we, you know, again, we sort of nerd out on things like, you know, light fixtures or, you know, yeah, sure. that stuff because, you know, to us, we've done it before. And, and sometimes, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to use that couch again, you know? So <laughs> yeah, what can I do? And I, you know, I've sort of got into, uh, for many shows, either out of necessity or out of ego, I want to reupholster some furniture. Even if it's the prop house's furniture, you get permission to, to hey, I'm going to update your furniture, or it's going to match the color, color, the color coding that we're doing for this character, or uh, your sofa looks a little dirty, um, you know, and, um, and that's a real way of sort of um, individualizing your furniture too is that you know maybe you can't afford to be buying every piece of furniture but for this sequence you can you know do a quick reupholster job again the studios jump when you say jump when we walk in um yeah. like all the furniture i had reupholstered on the muppets you know all of it uh i i said in one production meeting i said um every time a muppet sits down and uh, an upholster earns his wings because <laughs> Because there's a hole cut in every piece of furniture, so the puppeteers, you know, yeah. underneath it. So you know that became like you know that was a whole big education. Both uh, the Muppets I did in 2015, and then this one we just did a few years ago, 2022, is you have to think ahead. On uh, I ask in every production meeting, are they going to sit down? Do they sit? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I talked to I interviewed Bruce Lenoyle who works on both of those. I love on the Bruce. Muppets and he, yeah, Bruce is cool. I didn't watch his interview. I didn't get that far, but I will. Yeah, no, he was really cool. Yeah, he grew up in like Jersey for a little bit or right on the border of New Jersey and that, and that's where I'm at. But uh no, he right. was, he was super awesome. So, one thing I have to ask is you kind of mentioned like the personalization uh when you're mm -hmm. reupholstering. Have you ever put anything in the background? that was like a like personal touch or something that meant something to you. Do you know what I mean? Like when people hide oh, yeah, I did things. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes we do it on bulletin boards. Um, but I, oh. again, my early films, my early films, I would always include a fish on the set. Um, what so do you mean by a fish? Like a, I, a, a mounted fish? A, or a picture of a fish or a ceramic wow. fish. That's great. Any, you know, there's lots of ways you can, you know, if you're clever, you can get a fish on the set. It could be that an ashtray. Awesome. You know? But but I think what we do for personally, uh, generally, and it, sometimes it's out of necessity, is um, is harvest stuff from home for bulletin boards or or, or filler in the junk drawer. And so, uh, you know, my older brother called me Savy Saver because I'm uh, – <laughs> A, a collector and I say <laughs> a lot of things. And so you asked, you know, do you have stuff? Uh, you often ask your guests if they have stuff for movies. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I have an entire basement full of stuff. For you movies. have everything. I mean, not everything because I'm, I also don't want everything. I have a certain yeah, yeah. sense of taste, but you know, I also have in the basement in bins stuff. I think I'm going to use on a show. And so I have like vintage this and some weird telephone books and while you were out pads from the 1970s. And so I like to layer uh, sets so they have a history in them. And so I collect ephemera and weird things from different eras to salt in. And so I, I let my crew know oh, I'm bringing a bin of stuff and they kind of roll their eyes because now that's <laughs> one more thing we turn to Dawn. Um, yeah. But, um, so, yes, a lot of times, um, I don't think I put family photographs in usually, but I, I almost always put pictures of, like, my cats, because I've had cats over the years. Oh, ah, cool. You know, I mean, because you're just looking for things like, you know, you got some secretary, she's got a bulletin board, she doesn't even get a line, but, you know, maybe it's the, the, the camera starts on the phone ringing, and no one's answering the phone, and pull back, and there's, a you know, her schedule, and whatever, some tickets on the bulletin board, or whatever, and then there's a picture of one of my cats. That is awesome. That's great. I got to go back because, you know, it's so funny whenever I interview people, it's like you're going through their IMDb and you're thinking about movies. So I was, I, this is not a joke, Don. I was explaining to my 
I was saying them out loud, the movies that you worked on, like when Jamie reached out to me. And uh, I'm like saying the movies. And I said, Soul Man. And she, you know, I'm like, man, he worked on Soul Man. And she goes, what was Soul Man? And I like explained it to her. She could not believe that it was a real movie. Th- she thought I was like joking with her. And then I let her look at the, watch the trailer of it. And she was like, oh my God, I can't believe they made that movie. At the time, we thought that was a little bit. <laughs> oh my God, yeah inappropriate and you know and I, I would love to hear what ray dong chong has to say now because she was certainly enlightened then and <laughs> you know it was a break for her maybe or at least it was a job but how what a stupid kind of concept but you know that's what those films were we were a little more innocent oh, yeah. and, and, and you know whatever back then see thomas yeah. Howe, man he was uh he did a lot of movies. Like he's still working today. Like he's a busy guy, but I wonder mm-hmm. at that point, if he had somebody that just said, take whatever, because I bet he could have held out for like whatever movie. Cause out of those, all those guys, uh, in the outsiders, he was great. Like he's a great actor in that movie. Right. Right. I think, um, I don't think until we got into it, we realized we were on a slippery slope. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when you walk out of the makeup room with that makeup on, you're like, okay, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> what's happening right now? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Man. And so you know what? Maybe <laughs> it would play today. I don't know. I mean, it's it's so off, you know, that maybe it would. Yeah. No, I haven't seen it in so long. But I love his movies. Like, he's one of those guys. I'll go back and watch a lot of his, a lot of those, like, 80s, 90s movies because he's so good. But, uh, yeah, that's so interesting. And so when you're doing this, you're on set every day? Because obviously no. it's like, or you're, no. oh, you're not on set. You're on the next set. Unless probably, I'm right? the on-set dresser, I'm not on set. Oh, I, I, okay. I always say if I'm on set, something's going wrong. No, uh, I, open, <laughs> I open the set in the morning. So if it's a new set um, and we're, you know, in one end of town and the studio is in the other end of town. And let's say I'm prepping the this, this soundstage uh sets which are you know shooting tomorrow i open the set in the morning on location let's say in glendale make sure that everything is there and that the director and the dp like it and then i communicate anything that's like let's say there's a passage of time or there's a a stunt and I, i okay all the stunt furniture that i had built is over here or when we get to you know when we get to the dinner scene all the plates and dishes are 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 staged over here on this this cart um, and then bye. And, you know, uh-huh. and it used to be before cell phones is when we left, we left, you know, like, really? people trusted yeah. us. Yeah. like okay, yeah. Don's going to go and do his job. The onset dresser is doing his job. And, and now, you know, it's, it's gotten film production still runs pretty quick, right? You know, you've got to get a lot of, of, of stuff done. So you have to be pretty efficient so they don't aren't usually going to call and say, and say, "Hey, don't you? We hate your chair. We're gonna, we don't come back and get a new chair." <laughs> yeah. uh, they know how long that'll take. Generally, the AD, the first assistant director, knows that. So what I've learned is to supply extra some things uh, that I think I always have what I call premonitions, and what I yeah. think that maybe they're not going to like, like. You know, if they, yeah, I, I want to give them ex- several other light fixtures. Uh, I might give them a couple extra pieces of art in case this one's got too much white in it or it's too whatever. Um, you know, because sometimes when I dress a, set, I dress a set, I have extra stuff because you don't know where everything's going. You get into the space and you figure it out. It's I, I, I never have been the person to know exactly where every single thing goes. We have yeah. to do what's called the director's plan, and then the more you know for each set, and so the set designer, the one who's drawing the plans, the basic architect of these sets, is gives you a, a blank of the room, and it's, and then you're drawing in, okay, couch, two chairs, lamp, lamp, you know, whatever it is, and then I share those very often with the DP, saying lamp, lamp, light fixture, light source, uh, and then maybe uh, they get published in when we go on a, a tech scout, and on a tech scout you get. I call them fun packs, but it's a stapled together thing. And it has a drawing of every single uh, plan of every set. So here's her bedroom. Here's the hallway to her bedroom. Here's the whatever other sets. And so in those, if it's important, I will draw in the key things. Here's the chair that gets broken in scene four. Here's the yeah. uh, light fixture. Here's the light switch that Jane turns on and she comes at, um, I mean, the light switch. So 
so people don't have any questions about it and or on the tech scout they look at it and they're like oh no i wanted to come in that door because this is how we're shooting i'm like okay erase it or change it boom yeah, you yeah. the plan so no i'm not on set i mean i people are always like oh you worked with elizabeth taylor you worked with so-and-so you worked with so i'm like I was on the same show as them and I supplied a bed for Elizabeth Taylor, but I did not like, you know, yeah. she's not my best pal. I have no relationship with the actors. And like I say, if I'm on set, something's gone wrong. I need to yeah, be working. No, that's I'm true. always looking ahead. Yeah, so no, no, that's... Well, I do. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's what you got to do. Now I was going to ask if you just, just the timing of like your careers, uh, Tim Robbins, if uh, you bumped into him on Pick a Destiny. I'm, I'm guessing. I think yeah. I'm, I'm doing, yes. And that, because it was a small really? movie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and John Cusack. And, you know, because of Catherine, it wasn't because they remembered me, but because my best friend was friends with all those guys, uh, yeah. the actors gang people. And so, you know, it's a small Hollywood. It really is. Uh, and you, you were saying that early. It is true. So if I don't know them, friends of my friends know them. And yeah. you know, we went to parties together, that kind of thing. And then you'll um, know him in minutes. You'll remember so many different stories just by the friend of the friend in this right. situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because we would go to the Actors Gang Theater, too. So we, you know, that was interesting because, you know, in film school and in theater school, they were in theater school. We were all kind of the same at the same strata. And then, you know, Catherine and I start making sets, and many other people do sets for movies, and you start to see that strata separate. So, you know, they don't want to be talking to the set decorator unless they have a problem or unless we really were friends. You know, they end up, and just like I do, I hang out with set decorators. I hang out with, you know, other artists and, and they hang out with other actors. And so, you know, that that doesn't, that, there isn't a lot of crossover, I would say, you know. Actors hang out with makeup and hair people because that's who's touching yeah. their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they get to know them real oh. well. Yeah. So I, you, I have two. This has been so much fun. Uh, so one question you, you kind of alluded to the question I always ask people at the end. But one is, do you still have the Francis Ford Coppola letter? I do. I that's do. amazing. I don't have it in front of me here, but I have it. Like no, a that's scrap fine. Book. No, that's that. No, that's great. And then two, because you were so nice to send the hat from uh, Piccadesti, uh, the pizza place. Uh, and I you just mentioned you have a lot of things in the basement. What are some of like your prized possessions? Is it like your first? Did you keep anything from like your first film? Like, oh, funny. Yeah, I. You know, the, they interviewed me for um, uh, movies that made us about. Um, oh Nine yes, yeah. And I, Joe Dante and I don't thing, think yeah. I don't think it's in the cut, but you know, there was a graveyard scene in there somewhere, and I kept one of the statues from the graveyard. It's still decaying in my garden. Um, I do have one of the picks of the pick of destiny. I have one. Um, <laughs> I kept, you know, I, 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 I don't want everything. And some of it I, I yeah. let go of, but I still have some um, baskets because uh, we, or, we brought in um, on medicine man, which Sean Connery and Lorraine Brock, yeah. we brought in Brazilian um, native uh, actors that from the Yanomani tribe. And um, we bought basket because we were dressing the set. We bought shipped from Brazil a bunch of these baskets, these handmade baskets. And so I still had two of them. I didn't even think of it until I was having lunch yeah. today downstairs. And I was like, oh, that's from, you know, Medicine Man. And um, what else do I have? I, I have, you know, um, I, re I watched uh, because of this interview, I watched House 2 and there's a sequence in the basement where Ari Gross sits on a chair. And I was like, oh, that's where those chairs came from. Because I have they oh, were three mismatched yeah. chairs, three chairs. They were like oak chairs. And they kind of have the spindle, the back, that kind of does a little. And you'll no one will see it but me. But for two seconds, he sits on this chair. I'm like, oh, that's where that chair came from. So sometimes <laughs> you end up with stuff because they're going to throw it away. And, uh, and or they become a gift, like the Pick a Destiny <laughs> pick was a gift. That is so cool. I, I think it's so great that you had the wherewithal in the beginning, like to be like, oh, this is really cool. Like I know you did, you had that history before because you said you like going to thrift sh shops and getting old items. But I think it's really cool that you took that from the graveyard scene. I hope you had a house then 
Or were you lugging all of these things from apartment? I, you know, for apartment? Years, I know because I for years always have had houses. Um, I rented oh, a house for years, and uh, yeah, and then I had I've always had gardens. Uh, that's important to me. I always wanted to have outdoor space, and you know, yeah. I, I you know if you don't live in the middle of well, I do live in the middle of town, but you can you can find garden space and um, uh, and be able to keep stuff. And then this house when I bought it in two thousand it has a full basement and I would just cram stuff in there. And, you know, it was all stuff. That, a lot of it is just stuff that I've collected, including I'm a, I collect portraits and um, have collected portrait thrift store portraits of cre creepy, oh. angry, and suspicious people. And, really? Um, yeah. And I've had two shows of those paintings uh, recently in the last <sighs> over 10 years. I, I, the name of the show is called, who are these people? And um, oh, cool! They, so you blow yeah. them up, or are they just like you? You get no, film, they're, or it's... they're bad thrift store paintings that I, I can't use them on the shows because they're not clear. Yeah. So they're just a collection, which is a weird collection to have of other people's. They're everywhere. This is a blast of somebody I don't know. You can't that's really see it well. Really? But I, no, I like see it. That's awesome. Person. And so I've been collecting these portraits forever, and uh, some of the very first portraits came out of an attic set on um, House One. Because I remember I had four of them uh, from the decorator because she was going, Don, do you want these? You know, because a lot of stuff gets thrown away. It's those non-union movies. They weren't established with a studio. So it all went in the dumpster or you sent it to the thrift store. And since I'm savvy saver, I didn't let anything yes, go. I could afford not to. Um, yeah, That's but also so awesome. just weird bins of, like I said, old vintage stuff that I might use on a show that I just think it's, I will ne I'll never find that again. Yeah, no, so, that's true. No, especially even like the the message pad, like the like answering because people don't. Have, yeah, people don't have used that anymore, so it might be hard to get. That's good. That's a smart thing to do. Yeah, and you know what it was is that I I remembered them from my childhood. I remember secretaries having that and tearing off that little note and here, you know, Mister Baxter, while you were out, you got a call. <laughs> um, yeah, and those kinds of things, you know. Again, I'm drawing on my memory because I'm a pretty visual person. I have a uh, uh, observant about things in the world, and I have that visual. And I'm like, okay, you know, you always just draw on what you know. And so yeah. that's, you know, that would end up on a bulletin board while you were out. No, that's so <laughs> cool. Now, Don, this has been so much fun. I got to ask, did your did your brother ever get into film? Was he in Hollywood too, or? No, he got a degree from San Francisco State. And um, again, we made these spook houses and he we used to make um, monsters for our spook houses and we would take castings of our faces like out of plaster. Yeah. And he segued into being a sculptor. And oh, so wow. he is, is um, spent his career sculpting plaster and renovating Victorian homes in San Francisco. <sighs> taking molds off of things and then casting multiples of it, much like these faces we did for the spook house. Oh, um, man. Yeah. So, that, you know, <laughs> he went a whole nother creative direction. Um, yeah. It's funny. Cause yeah. Uh, he didn't even want to come down to LA and, you know, like I said, I didn't <laughs> apply anywhere other than UCLA. So, um, uh, and then I stayed here, you know, I moved here and stayed here. It was a good fit, but he's yeah. made a cold beer yeah. out of, of I bet. especially there oh my gosh yeah 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 that's pretty cool that from the spook houses you you both are doing something with it within that you know that's right. really neat that that he was fun doing always the mechanical part yeah oh man don this has been so much fun i'm so happy we were able to do this and thanks for sending too. me that that was so cool i love your show so, so i'm honored uh, to do this thank you doug Thank you, Don. And I'll, this will be out probably the next month. I'll shoot you an email when the link comes out so you can check it oh. out. And uh, thanks so much for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. This has been great. All right, Don. Cool. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Appreciate it.